first, when you think of a black work embroidery, what do you think about? Do you think of English patterns? Or do you think of Italian patterns? Or do you think of German patterns? I've been studying black work embroidery for well over 18 years at this point. Um, I've been doing it uh, since I was about 16 years old. So welcome to my class today. Before we get started, please make sure to select thumbs up that you like the video. If you have any questions during the video, please post them in the comments below. And as always, please click subscribe to be updated when new videos come out. So, welcome to my introduction on blackwork embroidery. So, what is blackwork? Blackwork is a reversible embroidery stitch, usually done with silk thread on linen. Over the centuries, black work has also been referred to as Holbein stitch, back stitch, Spanish work, festoon stitch, square stitch, or double running stitch. Or it's also known as Mamluk embroidery. By counting the threads, the double running stitch is a series of two journeys. On the first journey, the pattern is to work every other stitch. And with that, you will get an in out, in out, in out pattern. Then on the return journey, you fill in all of the blank spots to create one continuous line. So on the return journey, you will go in, out, in, out, in, out, and the finished product looks like a single line. What materials do you need? A slate frame is historically accurate. However, if you want to use just a, a round frame, not historically accurate, but it's still, you can still work with it, or you can also use a scroll frame. I personally advise not to do the scroll frame, but that's just personal preference. I've tried a scroll frame before and had difficulty keeping my tension. If you use a circular hoop frame, the problem with that is, again, with your tension as you move the hoop frame across your fabric, you tend to warp the linen a bit and then it makes your stitches uneven. Next after the frame you need linen fabric. Black work could have been done on other fabrics such as velvet but it was primarily done on linen. Also you need silk thread. There were other types of threads used such as cotton but very rarely, and I've actually tried using cotton thread before and found it to be quite difficult. The silk thread, if you have a knot in your thread one way, you just pull the knot in the opposite direction and the knot comes right out. It's very easy to work with and it's very pretty depending on if you get twisted or untwisted silk thread, you can have an extra shine to it. The cotton thread, I found just if it got twisted up, it got knotted, it was difficult to get the knot out, and it's not as pretty, in my personal opinion. So you've got your slate frame, your fabric, your thread, you also need a needle. Beeswax is optional, but I highly recommend it at least for the ends of your threads to help your thread not fray. And you need to decide on the pattern. What is a slate frame? A slate frame is just simply a box frame where you stitch your fabric in the middle of the frame. And it helps keep the tension on all four sides. If you look on, my, on the page here, on the left-hand side, you will see an example of silk embroidery being done in 1568. And that's a German picture there. In the middle is what a slate frame looks like today. And on the right hand side is a, a painting by Francesco Casa from about the late 1400s. And again, you can see the slate frame, but also if you look, it looks like there's legs on the slate frame so it could be used almost like a table. What type of needle do you use? 
If you look on the left hand side, there's an enhanced portrait of Costanza. Probably mispronounced this. And please correct me if I do mispronounce this Costanza Cantani. And that's also from the late 1400s. And in that portrait, you see her with pins, a thimble, and sewing needle. For my black work, I usually just typically use the same type of needle like what you would use in today's modern cross stitch. But that's what I use. On the right hand side of the screen, you will see Viking era needles, and that's from Coppergate. The one thing you have to make sure of is if the eye of your needle is larger than the pointy end of your needle, then that might warp the linen a bit. So you want a needle that is about as straight as possible where the eye is not any bigger than the rest of the needle. That way it doesn't warp the thread at all and create or warp your fabric at all and create holes in your fabric. You also want to use a very thin needle for the same reason. What type of silk thread? I recommend using, and I'll probably mispronounce this, soy perle. This is a twisted silk thread that only needs beeswax applied to the ends of the threads. There is also the soy oval. If I've mis mispronounced that, please let me know. And the soy oval is an untwisted silk thread. This thread is shinier than the soy perle, but it also frays a lot more. I can show you examples of that later in this class. So the soy oval is shinier and prettier looking, but with that one, you really want to use the beeswax on it because it will fray and the backside, it will look, <laughs> look like a mess after a while. For Egyptian threads, blue, red, and brown, the brown could be faded black for common embroidery threads used pre in pre six, sorry, pre 15th century Egypt embroidery. The brown threads that we see in examples and museums may have originally been black since the iron used to dye the threads can fade over time as well as erode the thread. Black silk thread on white linen was definitely the most popular and the most favored in Europe. Red thread was occasionally used, as we saw previously, in Bess of Hardwick sleeves. In England, gold and silver threads were also used. However, a person had to be careful when using gold or silver threads due to the sumptuary laws. Among the restrictions listed in Elizabeth I's 1574 statute was that for gold, silver, or pearl embroidery, it was reserved for only dukes, marquises, earls, including the children of all three, viscounts, barons, and knights of the garter. Here's an example of a woman's Italian shirt from the late 16th century. This example is in the Textile Museum in Prado. And one of the things that I find neat about this shirt is not only is there black work on the cuffs and around the collar, but it's also going up the sleeves. If you look where the sleeves join the shirt, there on that seam, there's black work embroidery on all of the seams. So where there are gores on the sides, down the front and on the sides, going towards the bottom hem, there's more black work on all of the seams. I think it helps give it character. I love it. Can Gooderman silk thread be used? Gooderman silk thread can be purchased at Joanne Fabrics or any local fabric store. It's machine washable and it's a nice thread to begin learning black work on, especially if you can buy it cheaply with a coupon. I know Joanne Fabrics a lot of times has like a 40% off coupon, which makes the Gooderman silk thread ideal in as a, a learning tool. Plus it's machine washable. If, for example, if you look on the bottom right in that picture, those are cuffs I made for my son's shirt when he was, I believe, four years old. He was still able to fit in that shirt when he turned six and he did youth combat in the SCA wearing that shirt. 
Now you can just imagine how much sweat and dirt went into that linen shirt that he wore. And because I used Guterman silk thread on that shirt, I was able to machine wash it and keep it white, amazingly. However, as far as using Guterman silk thread or not using Guterman silk thread, if you're aiming for historical accuracy or you want a more bold thread, then I would not recommend using this. The Guterman silk thread tends to be very thin, and so you can see it up close, you know, to see the pattern, but as you step away, you cannot see the person's pattern as easily because it is very thin. And also, like I said, for historical accuracy, you would want a bold thread. That way, when you're standing more than six feet away from someone, they can still see the embroidery and actually see the pattern, and then they can compliment you on, wow, look at that pattern. What items were embroidered? The Moorish embroidery had been used to decorate various household items, such as towels, napkins, and cushion covers, as well as garments such as robes and veils. In Europe, clothes were embroidered, such as shirt sleeves, ruffs, cuffs, coifs, doublets, nightcaps, falling bands, along with handkerchiefs. Part of this was to do embroidery, it takes a lot of time, especially if you are doing black work embroidery on sleeves, on the fourth part of a skirt. That takes a lot of time. And so they like to wear their wealth. And if you can afford to just simply sit there and do embroidery all day, then that means you have lots of luxury, you have extra time on your hands. And so aside from your pearls, your velvets, your furs, depending on your station, you would also show off the black work embroidery. What about a pattern? On the left hand side is a 16th century Italian sa sampler from the Victorian Albert Museum. And with this sampler, I have, um, I will put the link in the description below, but there is a website out there and they have I believe it is 25 to 30 patterns that have been recreated from this sampler. And then on the right hand side is Jane Bostock's English sampler from 1598 and that is also at the Victorian Albert Museum. One of the nice things with using a sampler is you can sit and pick out which pattern you want to use for your particular item. So if you want to embroider cuffs, I can look at this and I could recreate that specific pattern or I can use it as inspiration while creating my own pattern. Now, if you're just starting out, I suggest to start with a simple pattern. On the top left-hand side is a pattern from Egypt, it's about circa 13th to 14th century. It is blue silk on linen. I believe it's unbleached linen. And if you look, it's just got a simple line on top. And then right below that is another simple line. And then a little zigzaggy pattern going from the top left, zigzag on the diagonal to the bottom right. And then two more straight lines underneath that. Fairly simple as far as black work patterns go. On the right hand side is Nicholas Basset's new model book pattern, um, which is German. It's from 1568. And with this pattern, it just looks like crosses, one right after the other. Again, fairly simple. With this pattern, unlike the one on the left, the Nicholas Basset's pattern, you can use probably using just one thread. So you would just go on your first journey, left to right, and then on your return journey, going right to left, and your pattern's done. On the bottom is the portrait of a lady as St. Lucy by Giovanni Antonio Boltraffio. It's from about 1509, and that's at the, sorry if I mispronounced this, Bisson 
por la misma Museo Nacional in Madrid, Spain. And as far as black work embroidery, I think this is the most simple pattern. If you look right on the edge of her collar, beneath the necklace, you'll see the necklace, it's a little bit of skin, and then the square neckline of her dress. And right on the edge of that square neckline is a single dashed line. About as simple as you can get for black work. So how do you begin? First, you want to weave your thread in and out, typically through the fabric. I shouldn't say typically, sorry. Going ahead of myself. Yes, so first you want to weave your thread in and out through the fabric. Typically, I work left to right, and I count approximately every third or fifth hole per stitch in the linen fabric. Later, I can show you the differences between every third hole and every fifth hole, because that will then determine how small or how big your pattern is. And once you are at the end of the line, then the return journey begins and that's where you fill in the spaces. And then when you are done, you want to weave the tail of the thread into the pattern on the underneath side. You also do this at the very beginning when you start off. So when you start off, you'll have a little bit of the tail on the underneath side and you'll just weave it into the pattern as you go left to right and then return and then the end of your thread gets woven in at the same place your tail was. If you're in the middle of a pattern, you might be able to split it part on the left, part on the right, but I can get into more of that later. Another option is to tie a knot at the end of your thread. However, if you do tie a knot, there are a couple of issues you may want to know about. One, depending on how big or how small you tie your knot, if it's small and you machine wash your fabric, that knot may pull through the fabric and now you've lost part of your pattern. The other thing is if you want your pattern to be completely reversible on both sides, depending on how many stitches your pattern was, where your knot is may not be at the exact starting place as where your thread started. So on the underneath side, you might have a knot here and a knot here and a space in between where there should be another stitch. Again, personal preference. I have known some people to knot their threads and they like to do it. I just recommend testing out and see what works for you. On the picture here, you will see at the very top, the pattern is that simple line that I mentioned on the last screen. That was on the square neckline. It's just a single line. And so to start off, here you have the dashed look of in, out, in, out, in, out. And then when you get to the end of your, whatever it is you're embroidering, the end of your cuff, collar, whatever, then you start your return journey. And now you go back right to left, back to where you began. And again, you do the in, out, in, out pattern. And in the end, you have a complete picture. So again, what do you do with the end of your thread? On the far left hand side, you can see where I had just done a quick sampler. And on that sampler, I was testing out different silk threads. The very top thread is the Gooderman silk thread. And then the middle, I believe that one was the untwisted silk thread. And then the third one down was the twisted silk thread. That's the differences between the soy oval and the soy perle, but I was also testing out the differences between beeswax on all of the thread, just on the tail ends, or no beeswax at all. That's why there's three sections of three. But for my quick sampler, you can see where I just, I wove the tail ends into the underneath side of the pattern. If you want to try to be a little more neat in the center section, or the center picture, it's the backside of a sampler by Elizabeth Burton, about 1701. So I know that's out of the time period for the SCA because we only go up to the 16th century. But anyways, um, the backside of this sampler, it's from 1701, it's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. But as you can see, 
there are, you can see where some of the tail ends are, but for the most part to me, this looks fairly neat and pretty. On the right hand side is a collar I had done, and that is with the Soyo Val silk thread. And with that, there's no beeswax on the tail ends of the fabric or on the thread. And that's where I learned the hard way to use beeswax on the tail ends of your thread. After you've embroidered your piece, then attach it to your garment. On the left hand side, you will see where I embroidered the cuffs and the collar for a shirt and then I cut it off of the slate frame and I attached it to a shirt for my husband. Do you want a challenge? Try doing reversible cross stitch. This is a 16th century shirt. It's at the v &A Museum and I can um, put the link below for more information. But with this, this collar, the cuffs, everything, it's reversible cross stitch, which if you look at reversible cross stitch is black work embroidery, just done in little X's all over the shirt. And when I mentioned the differences between Guterman silk thread versus like the soy oval or the soy perle, this is just to show you, this is what Guterman silk thread looks like. So it's blue, um, blue plastic, and then very thin silk thread. The soy oval and the soy perle, this is how they're sold. As I mentioned before, you can use the circular hoops. Just be cautious because it will warp your th linen thread a bit. So once you're done embroidering, I suggest taking your thread off of the hoop and giving it a chance to rest and try to move the thread a bit so that way it doesn't warp as much. Remember that sampler where I mentioned the differences between using beeswax and not using beeswax and the differences between the Guterman silk thread and the soy oval and the soy perle. Here is that sampler. So if you look, this is the Guterman silk thread and then the untwisted and then the twisted silk thread. And then this section has no beeswax. This section just has beeswax on the end. And then this one, it has beeswax throughout. But like as I move back, you can see the twisted and the untwisted are still pretty bold, whereas the Guterman silk thread is starting to fade away because, well, it's a thin thread. The differences between the third hole and every fifth hole, this is a sampler. It, remember that 16th century Italian sampler I talked about? These are patterns from that sampler. And if you look, Oh, I'm on the back side too. If you look, this is every third hole on the whole sampler. This is a coif I made for my daughter, and I believe it has 88 diamonds. Each diamond with the flower in the middle it took me about 20 minutes to do, and this is every fifth hole. So, to show you the size difference, this is every fifth hole on the flower. And this one on the left is every third hole. So that's the differences between the sizing. So if you're doing something small like a collar or a cuff, I recommend doing every third hole. You will find it's also easier to weave your tail in back into the fa fabric on the underneath side if you do every third hole. If you're doing something larger like sleeves or the forepart to a skirt, you probably want to do every fifth hole, otherwise you'll be at it all day long. Remember how I mentioned learning the hard way about using beeswax, at least on the ends of your silk threads? On the Guterman silk thread, you don't need the beeswax, but if you use the soy valve or the soy perle or any other silk thread like that, you'll want to use beeswax at least on the end. Here is a partlet that I stitched. And on the underneath side is the untwisted without any beeswax. And then sections of it, you can start to see where it's fraying. Let me see if that zooms in. So you can see where it's fraying right there. So again, use the beeswax. Remember how I mentioned the Italian sampler that 
was from the 16th century and that there were patterns available online, let me show you that website. So go to Dragon Lore, I believe it's dragonlore.net. Yep. And then as you scroll down, right here in the middle of the page, it says where 25 of these patterns have been created. So just click on that 25 and you will see the different patterns there or at the very top, right underneath the paragraph, you'll see where it says printer friendly PDF version. So you can print this out. I believe it's three pages worth. There are other patterns out there, other samplers. For example, I have plenty on my Pinterest page. As you can see here on my Pinterest page here, just look up Tudor Blackwork Embroidery. I've got more than just the Tudor Blackwork. I also have Egyptian on here or any other Blackwork I can find. But here are a variety of patterns. For example, here in the middle of the screen is the pattern for the Bess of Hardwick sleeves. And more Egyptian black work. And also to give you suggestions and ideas for other things you can do for black work would be like a chalice veil or a chalice cover. And that's great for when like you go to SCA events, you want something to display your black work and also keep bugs out of your drink. You want to create a chalice fail. Or another thing, um, I've made one, but on the left hand side, you will see there's a needle book tutorial on that. The needle books were not period. I believe those didn't come around until like the late 19th century, but it's still a way to not only keep track of your needles, but also be able to display your black work embroidery capabilities. And then next to that picture right here is more um, more historical samplers um, with the patterns and more examples of black work. If you want more information on the history of black work embroidery as well as more samples and portraits with black work embroidery in it, please visit my blog at tutorblackwork.blogspot.com. I have been doing this research on my blog for about six years now. And there's lots of information, lots of patterns. Please feel free to check it out. Also, if you're on Facebook, please check out my page. It's Tudor Blackwork Embroidery. And on there, I've got a couple of videos as well as many posts and pictures of blackwork here you can see different examples of different patterns from English, Italian, and Egyptian. Here I also have portraits. This, for example, is a portrait of the Countess of Warwick from 1565. And as you can see, she's got black work on her collar as well as her sleeves. And then right beside her, there's also another painting here. And in this portrait, you can see she has black work pretty much throughout her outfit, along the sleeves, the partlet, along the, the collar, right underneath the partlet, as well as the forefront of her bodice and also the forefront of her skirt. If you have questions, I have a whole binder of documentation that I've been collecting over the years. I also have a, a collection of 16th century German patterns that was interpreted by Claudette Zeman. It's based on the patterns from Nicholas Basset's new model book from 1568 and Hans Hofer's form book line from 1545. However, I've tried looking on the internet and I can't find the source now. If you see here on the ElizabethanCostume.net page, it says that German blackwork patterns are temporarily unavailable. So if you have questions regarding the patterns for this, please let me know.
onto your pan embroidery. This does say 15th to 17th centuries, but primarily I'm going to be focusing on the 16th and 17th centuries. Here is an Italian example. This is from uh, this is from an embroidery book, and on the left hand side is a page from the embroidery book. It's by Zappino. Uh, it was written in August 1529. It's currently at the Met Museum. And I interpreted the acorn pattern. If you look at the very top of the left hand side of the page, you'll see the acorn pattern, and that's the pattern on the top right. And then in the middle of the page on the left, you'll see it looks like double crosses, kind of going up and then down, up and then down. And I've interpreted that pattern as well, and that's on the bottom right. This is another page from that same book and I've interpreted the pattern if you look the second pattern down on the left hand side where it looks like two triangles one upside down and one right side up and then a little line and then crosses reflecting reflecting off of each other and then triangles again that's the pattern on the top right and then if you count down see one two three Five patterns down, you'll see it looks like a reflection of crosses on the top and the bottom. That is the pattern that I have interpreted on the bottom right side. This is from an embroidery book from 1530. It is by Tagliente and it is at the Met Museum. The patterns that I interpreted from this page, the pattern near the top of the page is on the top left hand side. Of the page and then do you see the double cross pattern on the bottom left it's about the middle of the page on the right hand side that double cross pattern let me go back do you remember this from 1529 do you see the pattern on the bottom right from 1529 by Zappino yet Tagliente did it in 1530 at this time if you look at certain books you'll find that they reused the ink presses for different books. They just shuffled up the pages. That's also why if you look in recipe books from this time period, you will find the recipes might be the same. They've just been put in a different order, added in a couple new recipes, and voila, they have a new book. This is an embroidered sampler at the Met Museum. It's from about 1600, and the pattern that I am interpreted on this page is inside the red circle. It's near the top right hand side of the sampler and I've enhanced the embroidery on the top right of the page and this is an example where you can see some of the stitches are missing but because it's counted stitch you can count the threads where they're missing and fill in the line and create the pattern which I've interpreted and created below. This is from the same sampler. And inside the red circle on the left hand side is the pattern that I interpreted. On the right hand side is an enhanced picture of that pattern. And again, some of the threads are missing, but because it's counted stitch, we can count where the stitches are missing and find what the pattern would have looked like. And that's what I put on the bottom right hand side of the page. From the same Italian sampler, inside the red circle is the pattern that I've enhanced in the middle of the page. And then I've interpreted it and put it on the right hand side. This particular one, if you notice, some of the threads don't line up quite neatly. And so you can actually count the stitches because instead of being one continuous line, you'll see where the threads tend to sit next to each other in the same hole. And that helps with counting how many holes in between each stitch, as well as how many stitches per section of the pattern. And this is still the same Italian sampler we've been looking at. And inside the red circle on the top left-hand corner is the pattern that I recreated on the right-hand side. I've enhanced the picture. And then beneath that, because on the sampler, it just had that one, what would you call it? Uh, corn stalk, but 
but there was only one, but because of the line at the bottom, this is a pattern that you can add and add and add and create trim around, say, a collar or a cuff. So for the pattern on the bottom, I've put three side by side. And from the same embroidered sampler, inside the red circle near the top of the sampler, I have enhanced that picture and then recreated the pattern below. This is another example where the threads are missing in part of the pattern. Actually, if you look near the bottom left corner of the picture in the middle, you'll actually see the thread sitting up on top of the sampler. But this is because it's counted stitch. You can fill in the dots. Think of it like connect the dots. You can fill in the blank spaces and recreate the pattern that was on the sampler. And still the same Italian sampler. Inside the red circle, I've enhanced the picture. And this is very much a case of connect the dots because half the thread is missing. Again, it's counted stitch. So you can count the threads where they're missing and recreate the pattern. And that's what I've done on the bottom right hand side is a recreation of the pattern that is found on this Italian sampler. And still working with the same Italian sampler. There were many patterns on this sampler, so it's a great piece to look at. And I've enhanced the picture on the right hand side and then recreated the pattern below. And once again, if you look on the far right hand side of the enhanced picture, you'll see part of the threads are missing. But because it's a mirror image from the left side to the right side, you can still recreate that image when creating your pattern. And still working with the same embroidered sampler, I've enhanced the picture on the right hand side and recreated the pattern below. And here's one more example of a pattern from that embroidered sampler. And I've recreated the pattern, posted it below. And I have even more patterns from this sampler. If you would like to see more patterns, please visit the website on the top left hand side. Other examples of Italian blackwork from the 16th century is this embroidered fabric. It is at the Museo del Tessuto. If I mispronounce that, please correct me. Inside the red circle on the left hand side, I have recreated that pattern and put that pattern on the right hand side. And on that same sampler, you'll see it has a flower inside the red circle, and then I've recreated that pattern and put that on the right side as well. I have other patterns from this sampler. Please follow the link on the top left-hand side. This is a enhanced picture of a much larger sampler at the V&A Museum. It's from the 16th century. And inside the red circle on the bottom right-hand side of the picture on the left, I have included the two patterns that are there, and they're in the middle and the bottom right of the page. Now that we're done with Italian, let's work with a little bit with English embroidery. This is, uh, at least in the SCA, it seems to be a very popular, uh, before I forget, the SCA, that's the Society for Creative Anachronism. If you want more information, please visit sca.org. But this is a popular sampler. It is Jane Bostock's sampler from 1598. It's at the V&A Museum. And this is the sampler on the left-hand side. And inside the red circle is the enhanced picture that I have in the middle. And then on the right-hand side is my interpretation of that pattern. This is a painting of Margaret Roper. She was the oldest daughter of Margaret, well, sorry, the oldest daughter of Sir Thomas More. Her maiden name was Margaret More, and then got married and became Margaret Roper. This painting was done about 1535 to 1536, and it's at the Met Museum. This is another way of finding black work patterns. Instead of just simply studying samplers that exist, you can also go to paintings and especially the Holbein paintings. You can look at some museums, you can enhance the painting 
and figure out the pattern. You may not be able to count the stitches like you can on an actual sampler where you can count the missing threads and or the number of holes between a stitch, but you can still get the concept of the pattern. And then depending on if it's a sleeve with a really large pattern, if it's a collar with a smaller pattern, you can kind of guesstimate if it was every third hole for a stitch or if it was every fifth hole for a stitch if it's a larger pattern. So with this painting of Margaret, I have enhanced her collar in the middle picture, and then I have included my interpretation of that pattern on, of her collar on the bottom right hand side. This is a miniature painting of Elizabeth Lady Audley from about 1538. It's with the Royal Collection Trust. And with this one, you can see right along the trim, right around the edge of her dress, she's got, it looks like black work trim, but because it's a miniature, I'm sure it was difficult to get all the brush strokes just exactly right to get the pattern, but the painter got the basic idea of the pattern. And with that, I recreated what I think the pattern looks like, and that's on the bottom right hand side. And this is from a sampler at the V&A Museum. It's from, by, I believe her first name was Sarah Blake. It was done in 1664. And as you can see on the left-hand side, it is very long, very detailed, lots of patterns to study, which is why I color-coded the different patterns so you can have an idea of where to find this specific pattern on this sampler. And this is a case where you can go to the museum website, enhance the picture, and zoom in and actually be able to count the stitches for that pattern. And I have other patterns from this sampler. If you would like to see more patterns from this sampler, please visit my blog. The link is below on the right hand side. This is, um, it was done by a German painter. It's Holbein, Hans Holbein the Younger. But I've included it with the English paintings because even though the painting is labeled as a portrait of a boy with a marmoset, it's labeled as being from about 1532 to 1535. It's located at the Kunstmuseum. But with this portrait, you will find if you look up, just do a Google search and look up Edward VI, you will find this painting associated with him. But if you look up Henry Fitzroy, you might also find this painting associated with him. The, no one knows for sure who this boy is. That's why the painting in the museum is just labeled as being portrait of a boy with a marmoset. But they have it between 1532 to 1535, which to me automatically out like rules out that it could be Edward VI because Edward VI wasn't born yet. If memory serves correctly, he was born in 1537 because Anne Boleyn died in 1536. That is when Henry VIII, King Henry VIII, the famous king with six wives of England, married his third wife, Jane Seymour, in 1536. She soon became pregnant and then gave birth in 1537 to Edward, who later became Edward VI. But depending on other websites you look at, I have found some websites that associate the year 1541 to this picture. So if he was born in 1537, there might be that chance in 1541 that this could be him. But I still think he looks older than that. If it's Henry Fitzroy, there is a better chance of that because Henry Fitzroy was the illegitimate son born to Bessie Blount, the one recognized illegitimate child that Henry VIII was willing to recognize. And Henry Fitzroy was born in 1519. So if he was born in 1519 and this was painted between 1532 to 1535, then this to me looks more like a boy who could be 12, 13, 14, not a boy who hasn't been born yet or a boy who's barely five. But regardless of which boy it is, if you look at the collar, you can 
enhance the picture, which I've done on the right hand side. And you'll see there's like a little ocean wave picture with a line on the bottom and a line on the top. And I've recreated that pattern on the bottom right hand side. Now on to Portuguese embroidery. This is a page from a booklet of embroidery and drawn work. It's from the 17th century and it's at the Met Museum. And the particular pattern on this page that I have interpreted is inside the red circle on the left hand side. And I've flipped the picture so it's sitting parallel rather than perpendicular to the ground. It's on the right hand side. And this is a really good case of if you look at the lines on the top right side, the picture on the top right side, you'll see on the line, you'll see dark dots every so often. That tells you every dark dot is a stitch. So even though we can't zoom in enough to count the holes in between each stitch, you can tell how many stitches, like if you look on the top of one of those bubbles, or if you want to call it a curve on top of one of those curves, there are four dots. That tells you four dots, that's one stitch, two stitch, three stitch, and then you go back down on the curve. So I was able to recreate the pattern on the bottom right side. This is an example of German embroidery. It is from a German embroidered embroidery book from 1597, written by Siebenmacher. And although this is not a blackwork pattern, the pattern on the right side was inspired by the pattern on the left because it was from an embroidery book and it is a German pattern. So you can use patterns that existed for say brick stitch and if you want to use it to inspire you to create a blackwork pattern. This is a painting at the Kunsthistorisches Museum. It was painted in 1531. And this is uh, an example of where you can zoom in on the collar and you can study the pattern and recreate it. Can you count the stitches? No, but you can get a basic idea of what the pattern looks like and then recreate it, which I've done on the bottom right side. This is an example of embroidery from the Netherlands. This is a portrait of a young woman from about 1535. It's currently at the Met Museum. And this, if you look at, at the painting, you can zoom in, you can see black work along her collar, along the top part of her shirt, but also along her sleeves and around the cuffs. The problem is as you zoom in, the pattern starts to become blurred, as you can see on the right-hand side. So, it's not perfect, it's not as good as the Holbein paintings, but you can still get a basic concept of what the pattern looks, looks like, which I've recreated on the bottom right side. And for some other embroidery, have you heard of Kasuti embroidery? Here is an example on the right hand side from Kasuti patterns, and it is Indian embroidery, which looks, oddly enough, like Egyptian embroidery or blackwork embroidery or we can call it holbein stitch reversible stitch it's all the same thing it's counted stitch that is reversible on both sides well most times reversible on both sides kasuti embroidery dates back to the if i mispronounce this i'm sorry please correct me chalukya period from the 6th to the 12th centuries in india so if you like black work embroidery, I highly, highly recommend checking out this embroidery. And I've got the website link at the end right here. If you have questions, if you're interested in paintings or samplers that you saw, here are the websites to look at. And then here are more websites to look at. For the Kasuti patterns, that's the second one on this page. If you're interested in studying Indian embroidery, that is just like the European black work, if it's just like the Mamluk embroidery. See the video with a better visual on how to do black work embroidery. First, before you get started, you'll want to figure out what it is you want to embroider. Are you wanting to do a 10th century Egyptian shirt? Are you wanting to do a 16th century English partlet, a coif, something that's Italian? So first figure out what it is you want to embroider 
and then that will tell you what patterns to go looking for. Now, once you've figured out what it is you want to embroider, if it's a collar, a cuff, a coif, whatever, and you've got your pattern ready, then you want to make sure you've got your materials. White linen is the most popular uh, with black work embroidery. And also, I highly recommend using silk thread. Black was the most popular. If you're going with Egyptian, you can also, you can use red, you can use blue or brown. The brown may have been originally black and then just faded over time. But once you've got your fabric and your silk thread, your needle, probably want to use, um, if you want to be historically accurate, use a slate frame. Otherwise, you can use a hoop frame just when you're done embroidering, make sure to remove the hoop frame from the embroidery until the next time you go to use it because the longer the linen sits in the hoop frame, the more it's going to stretch and warp the linen. And then you'll have a permanent impression of a circle hoop on your fabric. So from there, you've got your pattern, your materials, and you're ready to go. Now let me show you what to do. Now. One other um, piece of equipment you may or may not want when doing black work embroidery is beeswax. I recommend using it on the edges of your thread, but that's personal preference. This is Guterman silk thread. You can buy it at your local store like Joanne Fabrics. It's thin, not as easily noticeable, but at the same time it's machine washable. Other types of silk thread, this is untwisted silk thread. It's very shiny and very pretty to look at when it's on the spool, but you can see it frays very easily. So this is definitely one to use beeswax with. And here is my favorite, this is a twisted silk thread. Again, I still use beeswax on the ends of the threads, but because it's twisted, it doesn't fray as much when you're embroidering. So now you've got your thread, you've got your hoop, your scissors, your beeswax. You're ready to go with your pattern. When I normally teach this class in person, I provide a little goodie bag for each student. And inside the goodie bag, I have silk thread and I have different types of fabric but to get started I also include students with canvas to work on and as you can see I have already started this so I'm actually going to cut this thread and start from the beginning now once you've threaded your needle You'll want to find your starting place. And with any pattern, I per personally prefer to work from the top left corner and work my way down and across like you would with writing. That's my personal preference because you will be going from one side to the other, doing a dotted line, and then you'll be going back and filling in your dotted line. Now, some people put a knot on the end of their thread. I personally like to weave my tail in. That's personal preference. So from here, I've pulled my thread through. I've got my tail back here. And now I'm going to go down. I'm actually going to skip one hole on this and go to the next hole. So my pattern is going to be every other hole. And then as I pull this through on the front, I want to make sure that my tail gets pulled in underneath and then I'm going to skip one hole and go to the next hole like that and then I'm going to pull it tight make sure your tail is woven in there we go and then back on the top skip one hole and go to the second hole
and then pull it through. Now at this point, make sure you, you want to keep your thread top, but you don't want to pull it so tightly that you pull your entire thread out. That's part of the reason why you're weaving the tail into the back side to secure your thread. So from here, I've skipped one hole and I'm going to the second hole and I'm making sure my tail is woven in and I'm going to pull it tight like that. And then back on the front side. And with this pattern, I'm just going to do a straight line across and back to give you the basic idea of how to do this. So skip one hole and go to the next hole. And pull it through. And then on the back side, skip one hole and go to the next hole. And I'm going to make sure my tail is still woven in and from here I'm going to flip it to the front and pull tight and you want to make sure the tail is still woven in now again some people like to put a knot at the very end my personal preference is to weave it in but that's just because one time I did put a knot at the end and the linen was white enough that when I went to wash it, the knot pulled through, which meant I lost some of my embroidery. So that's why I prefer to weave the tail in. So again, skipping one hole and going to the next hole and pulling it through. And as you can see, my tail is still being woven in. Um, as far as the length of the tail, I would give yourself at least an inch to an inch and a half. Part of that depends also on how small or how big you are making your embroidery. What I mean, for example, on this sampler, this is black silk on linen and every stitch is every third hole on the linen. But to give you an idea, on these two, the stitch is every fifth hole, so it's bigger. To give you an idea, this flower type and this flower type are almost identical. The difference is this flower on the petal here just has a little dent that goes in the middle. But otherwise, this flower dimension-wise is the same as this flower. But you can see the size difference between every third hole and every fifth hole. So it's er if it's every third or fourth hole, every third hole, you can get away with one inch tail, but it's if it's every fifth hole, then I would definitely go more for one and a half to two inches of a tail. Um, if you want to do every fourth hole, that's also personal preference. It, for me to just do every third or fifth hole. It just depends on how big or how small you want your piece. For example, if you're just embroidering a coif, then you could go for a smaller pattern. Just the same if you are embroidering an entire four part to a, a front part to a skirt or sleeves, then you may want to go with every fifth hole. So, now that I've gone in and out, in and out, in and out, as you can see, I've created a dashed line. If this was the end of my line, this is the end of my first journey, then I want to go back the way I came and fill in my holes. So from there, I'm just going to go in and fill in the dashed lines. And this is also where you want to make sure to weave your tail in. So that way it's woven in both on the first journey and the second journey. And 
And thinking of materials as far as the type of needle to use, personally, um, I just use whatever needle I happen to have. Usually it's a needle that I've used from a cross-stitch pattern. You'll find needles that have a sharper point tend to, they poke through the linen fabric, but can also sometimes snag the fabric, so you have to be careful with that. Just the same if you have a needle that's dull on the edge. It won't snag the fabric, but sometimes it's slightly more, more difficult to poke it through the linen. And now you can see I've created one solid line. Now if I wanted to do something of a pattern, like for example, say I wanted to do this pattern right here. Personally, what I do is I study my pattern and figure out how many spaces there are in between each little figure. So at this, there's one, two, three, four, five spaces in between each figure. So just for teaching purposes, I'm not starting a new thread. I'm just going to use the same one I have and find a new spark starting spot down below. So with this, I want to do every fifth space. I'm going to continue just doing as I was and doing every other hole. So I'm skipping one and going one down. So that's one. Skipping a hole and going up the next one. That's two, three, if I can find it, there we go, four, and five. Now that I've got my five spaces, now it's time to do my little figure. And so from here, if I can bring this up close, by the way, this is a 16th century pattern. Um, specifically, it's Italian. I'm going to go up diagonally twice to the right. So diagonally up twice, and then one goes up, over, and down. The other goes up, over, and to the side. So I said diagonally twice to the right, going up, so I'm going to skip one hole and go to the next hole, like that, and then pull it tight. This is the back side, and here's the front side. So now you can't see that dashed line, but the next one you will find. So skip one hole and go in through the next, and now I'm going to go up one, so skip one hole and go to the next, go up, and then over, and down. And now I'm going to retrace my steps going back the way I came. So I'm going to go up. And then over. And down. So with that, I've got the top portion of this. Let me see if I'll zoom in here. So I've got the top portion, and now I'm going to do the bottom portion. Or, actually, I guess it's the side portion. So from here, I'm going to go over to the right. Down. and over, and now I'm going to go back the way I came, going back over, up, 
up, over. And at this point, I'm just retracing my steps, doing the second journey, filling in this space. And now I'm back to the original line. And now if I want to continue my pattern, I'm going to continue going to the right. And I'm going to count five spaces over. So that's two, three, four, five. And now is when you want to go up and diagonally to the right again. So up, and up again. And then here's where you go straight up and then over to the left and then down. And then I'm retracing my steps going up, over, and back down. And now I'm going over to the right. Eh. Over, or sorry, going down. And now I'm going over to the left. And then I'm retracing my steps, going on that second journey. The goal is to make this reversible. So that way it looks the same on both sides. And that way it should hopefully resemble lace. Well, that's if you're doing more 16th century embroidery. And then if I want to continue, just do five more spaces. So that's two, three, four, and five. And now if I'm done with my pattern, say this is a collar and I've gone from one edge to the other, and now I want to fill in my spaces for the second journey, just go back the way I came. And as you can see, the dashed lines are filling in and becoming reversible. Now I recommend using, um, this is a cross stitch fabric, I re recommend using that first to practice on to figure out what you're doing and how you're going to do it. Once you've got a knack for this, then that's when I would suggest um, to move to linen. Just because with this it's a lot easier to see the holes and figure out your pattern than it is to automatically go straight to the linen. Now I finished my line. It's reversible, but as you can see, I've got a space here, but I still have to fill in this space here. So normally what I would do is I would loop this around and then weave my tail in and out, in and out before I cut my thread. So from here, I'm just going to weave it in the same as you did at the very beginning, giving your tail about an inch or so. So from here, I'm just going in from the right side and coming out the left side. And just weaving the tail in.
And once I'm done weaving the tail in to my satisfaction, it's time to just, you want to cut it as close as you can to the line without hurting your fabric or the thread. And see, now it looks reversible. How to dress your slate frame. Follow me. So in no particular order, the items that you will need for today, you will need pins, your fabric, I will be using linen fabric, scissors, thread, I'm also going to be using a thin yarn, but that's up to you if you want to use the thin yarn or only use the thread, a needle, bias tape, and obviously your slate frame. My slate frame is 15 inches by 15 inches, and as you can see, I'm using a scrap piece of fabric. So first I'm going to trim everything down to make sure that this fabric will fit onto my frame. Once you have your fabric square cut out, next you want to take your bias tape and you're going to cut two strips the same length as the fabric. Next, you'll want to unfold the bias tape, and then you're going to line one on the right edge and then the other one on the left edge. So as you can see, I'm unfolding the bias tape and I've got one corner up here and I'm pinning it down. Okay, one side done. Now time to pin the other side. So now that I've got both sides pinned, now it's time to take your needle and your thread and you're going to sew up both sides. Right now I'm threading my needle. Now that I've got the thread doubled, I'm going to put knots in at the, at the end of my threads. And with this, the stitches don't have to be neat, they just have to be secure. And to help secure the thread on the other side, I like to take my needle and stick it in between the two threads. And then pull it tight. From here, I'm just going to do a simple stitch just to secure the bias tape onto the fabric. Just like that. There is a fold. There's actually two folds, but there's a fold right here from where the bias tape had been folded, and I'm actually unraveling that fold and then that's where my stitches are going. So I have a straight line to follow. And once you have one side stitched up, go ahead and knot your thread and then get started on the other side. For the pieces of your slate frame, the two with the holes on the ends, these are called mortises, which would make these two the tenons. The tenon is the piece of wood that will go through the mortise, through the hole. And you want the two that have the tape already on there. And from here, I'm going to stitch these onto each other. So if you see, I'm matching up the edge of the fabric with the edge of the tape here. Now once you are done pinning right along here, now it's time to sew it into place. And 
and from here I am just sewing it the fabric onto the tape. Once you're done sewing the one side, go ahead, knot off the end of the thread, and then get started on the other side. And now that this side is sewn on, time to pin it to the other side. Now, time to sew this side. Next, you want to slip the tenon through each. There's one, and here's the second one. Now you'll want to take your four pegs and put them in the holes to stretch the fabric. Once your pegs are secure in the holes and your fabric is stretched. I'm going to flip this frame over and remember that thin yarn from before. You can also use string if you like and I'm going to cut off a long piece here and thread my needle and you want to tie it around one corner. What you're going to do is wrap the thread around the right leg and stick it through the bias tape. And then just keep doing that and it will start to look like spiral lacing going up the leg. And if I can get my knot out, pulling it tight. And now as you go, you'll notice some of the string will start to relax. You'll want to pull it tight as you go up. So now as I come up to the end on the other corner, I'm going to do one more around the leg through the bias tape and now if you can see I've got some loose string through here so I'm going to go to the very bottom make sure it's pulled tight and tighten up each strand as I work my way up the leg Now that I've done that, now I'm going to knot off this end, so I'm going to wrap it around the leg, there, around the corner, and I'm going to knot it again through the loop, through the middle, 
put my thumbnail over the knot and then pull tight. And one more time, just for good measure. And now that my thread is knotted, your corner knotted off. Now you want to wrap the yarn around the leg through the bias tape and just do the same spiral lacing that you did before. And through the bias tape. And as you can see, I'm at the other corner, but I've got some loose threads here, so you want to go back to the very beginning, pull tight. Hold it in place, pull the next string, hold it tight, next string, and just work your way up. This will help make sure that your fabric, as you can see, it's getting tight like a drum. And once everything is nice and tight, then you just want to knot off this corner. And congratulations, you have dressed a slate frame. Before I get started actually embroidering anything, first I like to come up with my pattern. And this right here is the 1598 English Sampler by Jane Bostock. And I've decided to use the pattern here for part of my pattern today. So if you can see, it looks like it's a braided pattern and it makes a diamond right through here. Now for the center of my, of my pattern, I decided to, if I scroll over here, if you can see there's a flower here and there's also a flower here and a flower here. It's all the same flower. And I've decided to incorporate that into the middle of my pattern. And here is my pattern. Here is that braided diamond. And then I've put the flower in the middle. Now, if you're curious how I was able to come up with this pattern on the computer, I was able to count the stitches over here. And then I went to Excel. And up here, right underneath font, if you select that and click draw border, and then from here, I can create patterns. As I will show you right here, you can click and create whatever pattern you want.
today, I will be showing you how I recreate historical embroidery patterns. The sampler that I will be focusing on is a 17th century English sampler at the Museum of Art in Cleveland, and it is silk thread on linen fabric. The website and the sampler are really neat because the museum allows you to zoom in to the point where you can count the stitches and you can see where a stitch goes up, skips a hole, and then goes back down on the next stitch. And so for today, I'm specifically focusing on reversible embroidery, also known as black work or Holbein stitch. But I will show you how I use an Excel spreadsheet and go from looking at the sampler and then putting the pattern onto an Excel spreadsheet. But before we get started with all of that, make sure to select thumbs up that you like the video. Please also click subscribe to be updated when new videos come out. And if at any point during the video you have questions, please post them in the comments below. So here is the sampler as you would see it on the Cleveland Museum of Arts website. And I am zooming in and this is the top left corner and you can see different colors being used. There is black, there is red, looks like leaves, hearts, feathery looking things. And now I'm just continuing to scroll through the sampler. I'm working my way towards the top right corner. Now I'm kind of going down a bit and over. Like I said, you can see different types of embroidery. Some look like it's reversible stitch, others it's reversible cross stitch. And then there's also an alphabet here, some animals. And then right here it looks like some embroidery was in black silk thread and those threads have disappeared from the sampler. And now I'm going to zoom in and work on making this leaf.
recently at a historical reenactment, I was asked about silk threads and which colors were historically accurate. But before I get into discussing about which silk threads were historically accurate in the 16th century, make sure to select thumbs up that you like the video. If you have questions during the video, please post them in the comments below. And as always, please click subscribe to be updated when new videos come out. So welcome to my discussion today on silk thread colors for the 16th century. I'm primarily going to focus on black work embroidery. However, these silk thread colors could be used for other types of embroidery during this time period. So what colors were used? Well, with that, that depends on what the item was that you were embroidering. Depending on what you were embroidering, colors that were used were black, brown, red, blue, green, and possibly yellow. These are two samplers. On the left-hand side is an Italian embroidered sampler, and you can see it's pretty much just all done in a brown silk thread. On the bottom right side is an English sampler from about 1598. This is Jane Bostock's sampler. And with it, you can see there are greens, there are reds. If you look closely, you can even find some blue as well as some black. So if you notice, these samplers have color in them. Here are some more examples. On the left-hand side, there are three pictures, and this is from a booklet of embroidery and drawn work. It's Portuguese from about the early 17th century, and here you can see green, you can see red, and then in the bottom picture, it looks sort of like a yellowish-brown color. On the right-hand side is a, an Italian sampler, and this one is from about the late 16th century, and you can see it has red, it has green. If you're noticing a theme here, samplers during this time period have color, mostly. On the left-hand side is an Italian sampler. This one's also from the 16th century. And on the top, you can see it has blue, then it has some green, and near the bottom, it has green worked in with red. And on the right-hand side is an English panel of black work from somewhere between 1580 and 1620, and this one has just black silk thread. So if you've noticed the theme here, most samplers during the 16th century have color. However, if you are going to be embroidering something that is going to be worn, such as a, a garment with like the collar around the neck, the cuffs around the wrist, sleeves, a smock, a coif, anything that you will be wearing typically was done in black silk thread. On the left-hand side is a zoomed-in picture of the neck area of Isabella of Spain, and this painting was from about 1500 to 1504. In the middle is an English smock from about 1575 to 1585, and on the right-hand side is the collar of Lady Margaret Butts, and this painting was from about 1541 to 1543, and it's English. So, like I said, if you notice in the samplers, there were lots of color and very little black, lots of blues, greens, reds, but with clothing, it tended to be black silk thread that was the favorite item. Here are some more examples. On the top left-hand side is a painting that's called The Portrait of a young merchant. It's from about 1541. Underneath that is the portrait of a lady. It's English from about 1536 to 1540. And I've zoomed in on her cuffs. In the middle is a portrait of a young woman. Um, this is Netherlandish and it's from about 1535. And you can see some black work up here around the collar as well as down on her sleeves and on the cuffs. On the right-hand side is a portrait of a boy with a marmoset, and again, I've zoomed in around the collar. One thing to note with this painting, it is labeled as portrait of a boy with a marmoset. However, if you look up Edward VI, a lot of times you will find portrait this portrait of him being associated with Edward VI. Um, Edward VI was the one and only legitimate son of King Henry VIII of England. 
This painting is from about 1532 to 1535. And more examples of black silk thread on clothing in the 16th century. On the top left hand side is a portrait of a lady. It's Italian from about 1520. Underneath that is, uh, if you study any kind of black work embroidery, this painting is usually one that will pop up a lot. And it is of Jane Seymour. She was the third wife of Henry VIII. And so it's English, it's from about 1536. And I've zoomed in on the cuffs. Again, you can see it's white linen with black silk thread. In the middle is, it's a miniature that I've enhanced. It's of Mrs. Jane Small and it's English from about 1536. I've enhanced the collar to show the black work around her neck. And on the right-hand side is a portrait of Lady Dacre. Dacre, sorry if I mispronounced that, please correct me in the comments below. But this painting is from about 1540. And if you look closely, she has black work around her cuffs as well as around her collar. Again, black work, black silk thread on white linen. But that wasn't always the case. This is Bess of Hardwick, and I believe she had four husbands during her lifetime, and each marriage helped her move up in the, what, the hierarchical food chain of England. And as you can see with Bess, if you look um, around her collar, her sleeves, this is all done in red. It is still blackwork embroidery, which is also known as like double running stitch or Holbein stitch. And the reason why it can also be referred to as Holbein stitch is because many of these paintings are either done by Hans Holbein or Hans Holbein the Younger. But this portrait, it is unusual because she has black work done in red, also known as red work. And this particular painting, it is English and it's from about 1550. If you have any questions or would like to pull up any of these paintings for yourself, this is my Works Cited page and my Works Cited page continued.
watching. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. Remember to select thumbs up if you like the video and click subscribe.